So baptisms, it's this declaration. There's a couple of thoughts that I felt and just thought about while preparing uh, about baptism, not preparing, but thinking about baptism. Is really, what's incredible is everybody in this room has made the same statement of faith. Not just the statement, but this act, this declaration of faith in Jesus Christ. Just want you to think about that for a moment. We have all, who have been baptized, we have all, everyone in this room, have made the same public, outward declaration, I am His. Isn't that amazing? I respond to, I acknowledge what He's done to me, and I am His. I surrender to, I submit myself to Him, and I am His. I think that's quite incredible. You know, in Ephesians 4, we'll read it now. Um, I might be jumping the gun there, but... Let's just read it in in Ephesians 4. Is it up? Okay. So it says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Let's go back. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So it's not only us that share... This declaration, it's not the, quiet, the quietness of the prayer that you prayed when you first surrendered your life. It's actually, all of us have moved past that. Isn't that amazing? We've actually stepped up and we've said, God, I want to make it public. I want everybody to know that I surrender to death on the cross, to the burial, the death of my sin, and to resurrection, new life. We have all made that same statement of faith. And then what's bigger than that is it's not just us all, but it's... All of them, everyone who believes in Jesus has made this, there's only one baptism, one Lord, one baptism. We've all made this declaration, this demonstration, I am yours. Not only am I made new, but I choose a new life. I just think the thought of that is quite incredible. There's only one baptism. I spoke a few weeks ago in the Sunday night service. I think it's out of Matthew 13. I might be wrong, so don't come back and correct it. I just don't have it here. Is that Jesus is the narrow door, and uh, we're called to enter through the narrow gate and uh, travel down the narrow road. And uh, some of the translations say he's the small door. Now, now, I know many of us would, would read that, and it has been interpreted that because it's the difficult road, it's the, the road less traveled, it's the challenging road, and it might be all of that. But I think the fact that he's a small door is because there's only one way to the right road. It's through Jesus. Only one. There's no other option. He's, he's not because Jesus is small, but it's just this one way through to new life. It's Jesus. We've all made this similar statement of faith. What I think it's important for us knowing that we've said we believe and we surrender and come under the same thing is that we really come to grips with how do these people live? So if we've all said we have the faith, the same faith and the same Lord and we've demonstrated it publicly, how are we all called to live? Because if you look across just the church, across this room, even in your home group, many people are living different ways and I'm not saying that one is like terrible. I don't know. You know that. I don't mean you should, I don't know if you know that, but don't think it unless you know it. Does that make sense? Um, anyway, I'm just trying to repair some home groups while we, I'm up here. But, but we're all living differently. So I think it's important that we actually kind of revisit how, how did I commit to live when I committed myself to Him in baptism? Because everybody's had a good start. Not one person who's made this choice to put their faith in Jesus had a bad start. Not one person. Everybody at that point of faith was delivered from darkness into light. Everybody a good start. But not everybody continues in the right way. So I want to just backtrack and I'm going to pray in a moment. But I want us to really be encouraged today. I'm not here just to witness some people. I'm celebrating what I've seen today. But actually, I want to refresh myself in the same clarity of faith I had on that day. As this is how I chose to live. And even if I was unclear then, I'm going to be clear today. I'm going to be clear on what my true commitment was. Because I know that when there's lack of clarity, it means that there's not one road. There's many roads. 
and now eventually get there. But that's not what God wants for you. He wants His best for us, and that's just one way. It's, this tr- it's trusting, it's living in faith, it's activating faith, it's demonstrating it, not once, but always. Amen. So let's pray, and then we'll get into some thoughts. But Father, we just thank you for this day. What a great day. We thank you for these young lives and older lives who have made this fresh commitment, this declaration of faith in Jesus that we've shared in by faith death but also come through it and into new life. I thank you that even for us, we do this by faith that no one in the room has to die, but everybody in the room gets new life. Thank you, Jesus. We affirm our faith in you. We affirm the privilege, the favor, the grace that allows us to actually enjoy the privilege without not actually going through the process. And so we just surrender our hearts to you, God. I pray that you quicken this word even in my own spirit that it wouldn't be a labor, but it would be easy. I thank you that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you're doing, what you're saying to us this morning. I pray that you would anoint me to, to communicate what's on the heart of God for this house and these times, and that you would anoint all of us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'm going to buck tradition. You know, sometimes when you're doing these types of services, I'm not going to preach on baptism, but it's very tempting to use all the baptism scriptures just to win some credibility. But I'm, not going, to, I'm going to try and not do that. Is that okay with you? Okay, so let's go. I want to start reading the scripture. John, the Baptist ministry, he comes in with a bang and he says this. I'm going to read from... Uh, Matthew 3, 1 to 6. It's going up now. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was, uh, sorry, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the paths for, straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. I hope that's just because that's all there was to eat. People went went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So John comes in, he's a weird guy. You know, if you you would know if you're weird that weird people get all the attention. And you wouldn't, anyway, so weird people do win some attention because we like to look at what's different. And so John had all this attention. He created his own platform and he made this incre- these incredible statements. First of all, there was this call that came out of his mouth. Now imagine this guy, he's new on the block and he starts to preach this word of repentance. Doesn't matter who was in the room. He shouted this word, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. But next to the call to repentance was the, the next thing was the reason why you need to repent because the kingdom is arrived. The kingdom is here. So if we look at his ministry, really he's calling to repent, but he's really speaking about the highlight of it is the kingdom, isn't it? There's a new rule in town and the way to get in is through repentance. So come in through repentance. Now for us, I think we start in repentance and these things stay fresh with us, but I, must know, I know that most of the people, including myself, that uh, walk this incredible road of faith, is I think repentance is not something that we daily are aware of and say, God, I just bring my life before you and I'm asking you to show me and when I see, I repent. But that's really what it is, is every day we don't just repent once, we continue to repent for that which is out of line in our lives, Amen. So, to, so in order, if that's a daily occurrence, we really need to know what repentance means. And we know it means to do a 180 degree turnaround to, if you're walking in that direction, touch what demonstrates, you can do it now if you want, anybody want? No, okay. So, so you do this turnaround and you go in the opposite direction. But we also need, the, need to know the biblical impl- uh, implications of repentance. Don't just say you repented, you re- you've repented. But what does that imply? What does that lead you to? What life does that mean? You should be living right now. And I really think that's where we can be refreshed. It's okay, God, I've been around for a long time, but how can I get myself stirred up in this area? How can I be sure that I'm on the path of the will of God and that all the activity of God's will is in fact happening around me because of the way that I'm living? So repentance, the implications of repentance are reversal and renunciation. So I was living in a certain way. 
And it might have even been a common way. So everybody's doing it. And it doesn't have to be necessarily sin. It might be a system. It might just be the way, you know, I, think, I can think of some systems that we all get trapped in. The money system. And we all need money, but there's a trap with money, isn't there? <laughs> there's this thing we hate being in, but we always kind of, very often we find ourselves there. There's the, there's the system of not having enough and panicking and then stressing and working ourselves to the bone to have enough. Now, we repented. So we didn't just repent of my, my ways. I, I went from one kingdom to another, which means I reverse, back it up, turn around and move in another direction in every area. Amen. So the first thing is reversal and renunciation. I renounce my sin. Just confess it. It says in this, in this passage that confessing their sins, he baptized them. The second thing, so there's three things, reversal and renunciation, submission and teachability, and continual shapeability. So let me just talk about submission and, teach, and teachability. And again, I think, I think it's just natural process that after time, we become less sensitive to things that we were when they were new, wouldn't you say? <sighs> hate to use, I really hate to use this thing, but I'm limited. So this, this example, but in marriage, you know, the first, for most, for some of us, I don't know, some people have different reports of their first years, but you know, when, when okay, before you married, <laughs> let's try and include everybody in the room, before you were married, there's some tones, words, and things you would have never ever said to your, your, your fiancé or the one you were courting, just never, but over time we become less sensitive, we become like, we, we forget that there is actually something to lose here. And so we just let loose a bit. We talk how we want or rather how we feel. And then actually what we're doing is we're creating an environment within marriage to live in, which is not always great. But why? It's because I lost my sensitivity somewhere along the line. It's the same in my walk with God. Is that I've been here for 10, 20, I don't know what the, doesn't matter really, it could be two months. Well, I was on fire for the first month, but I found my groove. Don't ever find your groove, church. Don't ever find a groove. You found your place. My biggest thing in coming to faith was being able to pray like everybody else. And I actually started praying words, not faith, because I just wanted a sound to fit in. So I'd lost my sensitivity to the change in my life. And then I started to manipulate or control my change, but just to be like everybody else. So, so the second thing is submission. So I don't know how, if ultimately submission to God and the Holy Spirit is I'm 100 committed, 100 percent committed and submitted to you, Jesus. Does this please you? Does this decision please you? Does this practice please you? If it doesn't, I won't do it, even though I really want it. Some things we really want and we go ahead and, and ultimately doesn't produce the best in our lives. The third thing is a, a continual shapeability. And we, we, we're declaring in this year to grow, that I'll never stay in this one place. I always want to move on to the next thing in God that I have to discover. And Paul made it clear for his life that he would never be satisfied with where he's at. And I think what this does is it should remind us, hey, when I, when I did that, I never saw myself settling down. I did not do it to get to a point where I stopped growing in God. That was never the plan and it was never His will for my life. And so I need to make sure that I am continually shapeable, that I am prepared to be open to the Holy Spirit's whispers. And I say whispers like that, forgive me, but just because, just let it be a whisper. You know how much, how much easier life is if we could just listen to the whisper? Just all it takes, God, is a whisper. If you don't want this, I won't do it. But often it's repetitive whisperings. And, you know, I heard John Bevere say this once. He said, um, don't contend with the Holy Spirit until He stops speaking. Don't contend with Him for so long that eventually He stops speaking to us. Terrible thing. So we argue these things in our minds and we grapple and we, you know, we think about them and we, we it's God, it's God, just do it. Put it down, whatever the case is. But that's repentance, reverse on renunciation, but there's a continuation. It's submission and teachability when always, and it's continual shapeability, amen? There's no birth into the kingdom unless we all hear the call to salvation. I just think that's quite amazing. So every single person in this room personally actually heard a call. Don't you think that's precious? 
Yes, I heard a call. I heard Jesus speaking to me one day, not them, me. And I just, I just felt, I don't know how, I couldn't control it. I knew that it was my time and I surrendered to Jesus. There's no birth unless we hear the call. And in the call, there's this repentance of sin and yielding to the teachings of Jesus. There's no growth without obedience to God's word. Amen. There's no growth without obedience. I can be called, but I still need to grow in obedience. And there's no lifelong increasing fruit, which is God's will for your life, unless me as a citizen of the kingdom is prepared and willing to yield to the Holy Spirit's whispers. No fruit. No birth. So we're all born, most of us have experienced spiritual birth. No growth unless obedience to the word and no fruit unless we're willing to surrender to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Isn't that quite a scary thing? Yes. A, I, I mean, I challenge myself, but let, it's just to make it easy, let, let me let you hear me challenge myself. When was the last time you heard a whisper and you did it? And, and then when was the last time you heard a whisper and it was difficult and you did it? Hey, I wonder the fruit. I wonder what should be flowing from my life if I just got these three simple, in fact, if I just continued in these three simple thoughts. So I heard the call, I repented, I reversed, backed up, went another way and I continued on that way. I never went back to systems and ways and thoughts and anxieties and all these things like everybody else. I just trusted in him because I knew what I was doing when I went under the waters. Anyway, God is good, isn't he? So I just want to touch on the continuation and then I'm only preaching for half an hour, which is like 12 minutes left. So I know you'd be pleased about that. But I always love this passage of Scripture in Philippians and then I'm going to try to race through some prayers. So when I, was, when I was preparing, I really felt God say, go to the prayers of the book of Acts and the prayers of the believers. Now, I was expecting to find some, some apostolic prayers that would help us through and uh, just some apostolic prayers, and I didn't. I found some real simple prayers, which shook the church and made it like it was never, it made it different forever. Simple prayers, that people walked in simple faith. We're going to go through those, but I want to just continue in this thing of continual change, shapeability. Everybody okay? So it says this in Philippians 3, and I'm going to read from verse 10. I want to know Christ. Anybody want to know Christ? Come on. What I want is for that to be my loudest cry. I want that to come out of my mouth every opportunity I have. My desperate desire is to know Christ. It needs to be desperate. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. So Paul's goal was, change. Paul's goal was that he would not only once come out of the water, but actually that his faith, his walk, his story would be many stories of coming out of bondage or coming out of darkness or coming out of himself into new life. Amen. So he found a way, which we found a way. It's what? It's to recognize within me what still needs to die so that I can put it to death, so I can step into new life. What speaks to you to help you know what needs to die? Jesus and His Word. What will help you know exactly what He's talking about? The Holy Spirit. You see, Paul found this thing. He realized as great, as mature, as, as many things that I've done for the kingdom of God, I still know there's more resurrection life for me. What's resurrection life? I don't know, but it's better than what you got now. More resurrection life. So there's more resurrection life. So what I do is in my pursuit to know Him, I remove the obstacles that are where, not around me, but in me. And I see that as this. I share in His sufferings. I take these things, they're difficult for me and I, and I lay them down and I put them on a cross and I, I say, God, have this, let this die. But what I've learned, if I'm willing to do that, if I'm willing to read the Word and, and let it confront who I am and if I'm willing to hear a whisper and then be obedient, what I've found is, come into this greater level of freedom. And actually, you know what? I'm just speaking for Paul. But I think what else is, I actually, uh, I'm learning who Paul is even again. And then I'm learning more of Paul. Then I'm, I'm seeing the wonder of who I am in Christ. Now the converse of that is, I heard the call once. I was baptized once. It was amazing. Jeez, those days were special. 
If we ever have to talk about our old days as special or more special, as the highlight, we have stepped off the boat at some point and we have mixed. We have mixed. Let me say this, good decision with good tradition, but not life birthing tradition. People get lost around us. People will become discouraged around us if all I have to tell are my old stories. My old stories will eventually lose the power to win somebody's life today. If I'm talking to them about what Jesus did 20 years ago in my life, I'm 18 years old. Well, what do you think? I'm only playing. So I've been saved for 18 years. I, I, I can't tell them only what happened to me then. I can tell them that story as the start, but I'd need to have what's happening today. And unless I'm walking this road where I know that I've heard the call, I have been born, but that I'm committed to growth and I'm committed, and I'm committed to the call to give God fruit that could glorify Him. I'm not going to see it unless I'm actually refreshed and revived in those things continually. So we're going to look at four prayers. We're going to try to look at four prayers, which I hope are just going to encourage us. There's nothing deep about to happen. Amen. So it says this, Acts 4, 27 to 31, the context is the miracle at Gate Beautiful where Peter and John were walking to the temple as they did every day. And they... they um, they f- saw this crippled man and he, he put his hand out for, for money and they said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give to you. Get up and walk. And he, and he got up and walked and this miracle caused such, a, caused such a, an uproar amongst the religious folk that they brought uh, Peter and John in and they questioned them and they beat them and, and they warned them and they said, you never talk about, I think the miracle is for this confrontation. You never talk about Jesus again. And, and they said, well, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna believe God? Are we gonna obey? God or obey man. So basically saying your religion and your authority on this, in this world has no power over me in, anymore. So anyway, they were flogged for it. So they didn't get off scot-free, but the leaders didn't know what to do. They let them go. And Peter and John went uh, back to the believers and they started to pray. First of all, they gave God glory for uh, what had happened. And then in the, we'll pick up through in the middle of the prayer. And it says, and now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand. Now, come on. They have just been told to stop it. Stop it, you church. And here's the ridiculous prayer. Because I don't think the passion of baptism was too far behind them. So give us Great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miracles and signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I love the fact nobody prayed for them now. There was a faith in the room. There was a zeal in their bones. They were baptized. And so when they prayed, Contrary to what the world was telling them to do, the Holy Spirit just came and said, you don't have enough, have more, and fold them again. And then they preached the Word of God with boldness. This wasn't just the two of them, this was the church. It's exciting church. But the thing is, they really had a threat. They really were persecuted. I think we struggle with that divide, eh? As we see great things happening in the persecuted church, and we think, yeah, but they really are fighting for their lives, and all they've got is Jesus and I don't know how we say that, but I think that's the general thought. So you've got to trust God when, you, you know, when you're fighting for your life. And so things happen. I asked Siggy, um, so this is this church. They, they're fighting for their lives. They're getting beaten for their faith. But there's something alive in this environment of persecution. It's not our environment. So I asked Siggy once, um, Siggy or Blender, for those of you who don't know, she was here a few weeks ago. She's a... Uh, a prophet, prophetess from Germany originally, now lives in America anyway. So she's been visiting this church for many years and just profound in what she teaches and who she is. And I asked her one day, I was very intimidated. It was one of the first experiences I had with her and I only was there because I was going out with the daughter of the people who were hosting her. So I was really way out of my depth. But at the dinner table, I'd prepared one question that I felt would get me through. And I asked her, why do you think there's so much happening in the persecuted church and uh, nothing happening with us. And I kind of said it in a bit of a judgmental tone towards us. I was probably only f- four then, spiritually, and so forgive me. 
But she said to me, no, 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 there's, there's no persecution here, but there's great threat over the church. There's a great strategy over the church. That strategy is comfort. That strategy is a fear of rejection. That strategy today, she didn't say this, today that strategy is stress and destruction. Those are very real things. Those are as real as you will lose your life. See, the the voice over the church, the warning over the church is exactly the same. The threat to the church is exactly the same. Keep silent. It's exactly the same, church. It's keep silent. You've got other things to prioritize. It's keep silent. Shut up. We might not hear those words in English, but if we had to glean into the spirit realm, I think we would be seeing that strategy out playing and quite successfully telling the church to keep quiet because the devil knows what happens in a, a speaking church. The devil knows the prayers that are prayed in a speaking church and they're not church that, uh, prayers that suit his kingdom. There is a real threat. It's comfort. And, and, you know, I think it's a greater threat because it's not in our face. It's not put in your face every day, pray or die, pray or die, pray or die. It's not. It's never pray and die slowly. It's just don't. It's just stop. It's just, it's not a big deal. It's, it's just my story. And I'm not here to convict anybody. I'm here. I'm like, come on. We want to be this church, God. We're not that church, but we want to be this church. We want to be honored. There's another scripture, and I'll speak about the thread over the church. It's Mark 4, 18, 19. Everybody okay? I'm smiling because I'm happy, so please don't be convicted to the point of being sad. That's not conviction. That's remorse. Stop it. Be godly. Receive the correction of the Holy Spirit and live in it. So it says this, Mark 4, 18. Uh, sorry, 4, 18. The seed that fell along the thorns represents others who hear the word of God. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth and the desire for other things. So no fruit is produced. Come on, snapshot, church. It's a snapshot of so many pockets of of the kingdom right now. It's not even an evil thing. It's worry. It's real stuff. This is our in your face. It's the worry of paying the bills and and feeding the kids and getting them to school and doing their homework. That's my life. It actually is. To be totally honest, that's my wife's life, but we are one, so I feel her pain. I'm only playing. I sometimes help when I can. But it's the stress of this life. This is the pace of our life, the pace of life today. It's unnatural, it's dangerous. And in fact, I don't think unless there's some resistance in us that I will resist it. I'll get swept away with worry. I'll get swept away in debt. I'll get swept away in all these things because I just don't have the time to take control of my life. This is a real threat over the church. So like this church in the book of Acts, Acts 4, praying for boldness, that's our thing. God, how do I activate boldness in my life, in my context? I've got so many things to worry about. How do I speak to it? How do I take control over it? Because I know that I'm in another kingdom, not the old kingdom. And this kingdom is a kingdom of life. It's a kingdom of blessing. It's a kingdom that brings me into the blessing of God's rule, not the enemy's rule or man's rule. But how do I activate it with boldness? I don't know, but start to pray and smile. Come on, stretch out your hand, Lord. Do a miracle. And I need a miracle in my bank account. But you know what? I'm going to sow my life and I'm going to pray for His miracle. I'm going to get out of my box and out of my worries and out of my cares. And I'm going to be somebody who touches the world despite. Because if I wait for my circumstances to be right for me to launch into my ministry, I will never have a ministry. I'll never pray a prayer. I'll never see someone healed. And you know what? I'll probably never ever get delivered from my financial issues either. Because all I've sown to it is worry. And, and maybe even just, they have made me selfish. Because I'm so invested in my worry that I cannot see another need. And when I hear about other people's breakthrough, celebration does not find me. So the first prayer... The first prayer of the early church was a prayer for boldness. Come on, how do I, I don't want to live this life hiding. I want to live it on the outside like I, I did it. I said I was going to do it. 
I went under. Yes, I went under. You went under. Yeah, I went under. What happened, Simon? That was a, the start of a declaration, a public, undeniable. What happened? I never would have known. Come on, church. That's how we started. It's in our hearts. It's in, our, it's in, our, it's in us. Next prayer. They prayed for healing miracles. Now, I don't even know if I should go down this road. I'm not going to go down. Is that okay? No, I'm not. But they prayed for healing. I love, I love Peter's simplicity when he prayed for healing for Tabitha. I was going to talk about Tabitha. She was Dorcas. She made clothes and she did. I just need to tell you this one thing. Because there's, there's a pattern in prayers. Is that God is attracted to people who are generous and who do, do good things for poor people. And if you look at these prayers, if you look at the encounters, those people, people who had encounters with God, you'll see the introduction. The so-and-so was known, he was good to the poor, and he was full of prayer. He was generous, and he was good to the poor. It's incredible how that lifestyle actually attracts God, that when you need it, Tabitha, Tabitha needed because she died. And Peter came along, put his hands on her, and she opened her eyes. It's quite incredible. Now, Peter was, Peter was a, an apostle, so maybe that's fitting for an apostle. But if we actually look down or look through Acts, Stephen was one of the first volunteers. He's just a volunteer. They needed a menial thing done. And so Stephen put up his hand, and they, he was qualified by the fact that he, had, he was a man of wisdom and the Spirit of God, and they prayed for him, and he went about his task. But the next time we see Stephen, it says, now Stephen, a man full of grace and God's power, did many signs and wonders amongst the people. It's just, a, just this, another Stephen, just a volunteer serving at the need in his house. And something was activated because he was prepared to do something beyond his own needs. I think the threat is producing a selfishness in the church that cannot, it's blind to the need around us. Now, I don't know, God help me be gracious because it's exciting to me. So I'll just say, yeah, I've got all this mess behind me, but I'm going to start changing the way I pray. Because actually, the other way is not working. <laughs> Keep finding myself in the same place. So the third prayer, second prayer was praying for healing miracles. It's just pray, man. Just pray. I love the story about Cornelius and Peter. It's an amazing coming together. So Cornelius was this God-fearing man. He wasn't a Jew and he wasn't a Christian. Now, the Jewish people have just been confronted with the reality of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and they really thought that it was just for them. Now, we see Cornelius introduced to us, and uh, what does it say about him? It says that he, and he, can we read it? Acts 4.10. Sure. Is everybody okay? So Acts 4.10, Cornelius stared at him in terror, so an angel had appeared to him in a vision, and he said, what is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, listen to this, church. Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. So we've come to you. Isn't that amazing? Come on. It is absolutely amazing to me. What, he was a God. Your prayers and your gifts to the poor. Before this moment, nobody would have really noticed. But God has received them as an offering. And so I've come to you. And he gives him an instruction. He says, send a servant to Peter. Uh, and then down the page, I'm just going to carry on with this. Is this okay? It's a beautiful story. The next day, Cornelius so he sends his messengers. The next day, Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town where Peter went up. Sorry, were nearing the town where Peter was. Peter went up on the flat roof to do what? To pray, I love it. And it was noon and he was hungry, but while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. It's just it's so ordinary. He was hungry, but they were preparing. It's gonna take time, so what should I do? Oh, awesome, I've got a gap. Let me just go up on the roof and pray again. Church, stuff happens. Now, I love this. Two praying men on different ends of the spiritual spectrum had an encounter created by God because of who they were, how they lived, and how they continued to live. 
And he brought these two together and Peter visited Cornelius' house. And it was something that was never, ever done before because Jews were forbidden to enter the household of a a Gentile. But he he knew that God had given him a vision that God had led him to this place. And so he went into that house and he started to speak the gospel. And uh, while he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on that whole household. No one prayed for them. While he was preaching, that's when you know you're preaching well, hey. While he was preaching, the whole house fell under the power of the Spirit and he knew God had has no favoritisms. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to tell this story. God has no favoritisms. I want to dropkick that thought. And I know we all know it intellectually, but I'm telling you, we live like there's favorites. We live, many people live, it's going to happen to you, but never to me. That's not God. That's not God. Not the nature of God, not the demonstration of God. It's not in the will of God. He favors everyone. He makes it all available to everyone. And He has created this unlikely coming together of two men from opposite worlds so that you would know God favors everyone and His heart for is, is for every nation. Amen. Amen. So just pray. I'm going to close with the scripture. And it's about our church. That's uh, Acts 13, is it up? It's coming up. I didn't give them this. I had repeated the wrong scripture. I'm probably going to miss a verse. So don't get lost and don't worry about the band. Um, now in the church at Antioch, there were, uh, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, uh, Lucius, I think, of Cyrene, and all these guys. And verse 2 says this. Mm, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work of, uh, for which I have called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. I know that that might sound like not a, an amazing time of prayer, but for me it's important because this is how people of faith live, is God speaks and God sends us out. I mean, we have just lost focus in terms of God's heart is not to favor one place, but it's to serve every place, every life, every nation. We have to come back, even in our prayer life, to hear a call and then to have the courage to release each other into what God is saying for their lives and for our church. So for our church, a people of faith, I would like our prayers not only to be for boldness, not only for healing power, not only for, uh, what was the last one? Not only just for prayer, for the sake of stirring up the activity of heaven in our own lives, but also that we would be ascending church and we wouldn't just send the six people sitting on the front, that we would send people And not just send people out, but send people in. That we would appoint people to special projects and special tasks. There's some things happening in our church right now we actually just can't do. We are unqualified to touch some things. And we need to send people. We need to lay our hands on them. And we need to pray, God, we want a supernatural outcome. Even though they're gifted, we want a supernatural outcome to this place that we know you're leading us into. And that means it's us. That means we're all in. We're all worshiping. We're all in the Spirit of God. We're all waiting for God to speak. It might be you. It might be you. It might be you. But I'm also going to say, hey, let's, let's step up. Let's be available. Church, what do we need? Church, what do we need? Church, what do we need? The days of visiting, the days of Sundays have to be over, church. They have to be over. And they have, they've been over for many people. But there's for more people, they have been just Sundays. And it might not never be a special project or a nation or a region or a land or a church plant or a campus, although all of these things are on God's radar. It might be the person in your focus group. It might be the person at work. It might be the Holy Spirit speaking to you in something. You realizing that you have been sent to that place. And it's time to make a difference. We're a church who prays because we made a demonstration. We made a declaration practical for everyone to see. I've stepped out of darkness, out of selfishness and deprivation. I'm just gonna speak about deprivation. In the kingdom of darkness, you, we were deprived. We need to see that. Obviously, we came under the power of hell, sickness, disease, destruction, oppression, oppression, bondage of every kind, but deprived. 
there needs to be some righteous fight in every believer to believe, God, I see signs of deprivation in my life and I refuse to accept it. In Jesus' name, these things must change. Come on, church. In Jesus' name, these things must change because I have come under the rule of one who blesses, one who provides, one who enlarges and increases me as a person and my world. These things must change as I enter into a new life, a refreshed life of faith in Jesus' name.